Hello everyone, how are you? Welcome to Community Connection, your window to the world around you. Elections are coming up, so many different ads, so much information coming our way, and with us today to clarify on the Democratic ticket is our own Michigan Chair of the Democratic Party, Lon Johnson. Well, Welcome you. to Community thank Connection. Thank you, thanks for having me on the show. It's wonderful to have you, and it's wonderful to have a good conversation about what's going on, um, about the elections, about all these ads that we're seeing, um, and uh, and bring some clarity to, to our voters absolutely, out there. Absolutely. Um, you have been uh, the Democratic uh, Party chair for about, about a year and a half now. Year and a half now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I know it was a huge upset with Mark Brewer because mm -hmm. I think he's been he's had that position for for quite a long time. About Eighteen years. Yeah. Eighteen years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was uh, well. Congratulations. Um, quite a uh, quite quite an accomplishment. Um, and you've done quite a bit in your tenure in the short in the short tenure. Um, you're very well known. Um, you've you've been very vocal. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your background and how you sort of came um, to that position. Sure. I grew up downriver just south of Detroit and uh, went to college uh, out west and uh, very early on uh, in the late 80s, 89, uh, became involved in political campaigns and uh, started working on political campaigns and you know, uh, moved all over the country running races uh, and working on uh, various causes and uh, returned to Michigan and and continued uh, being involved politically. And uh, in February of, uh, uh, as you know, uh, February 2013, ran mm -hmm. for chair and won. And, uh, you know, what we've been set upon doing is, is putting the party in, in position to win. You know, we, we continuously win on the presidential years. We won right. the last six Senate races. We won the last six presidential races. But these off-year elections where the governor's uh, race is Well, up. we really have an imbalance in terms of representation, sure. you know, in, the, in, in, in our, in our legislative, sure. legislative areas. Michigan's an overwhelmingly Democratic state. And yet our governor, lieutenant governor, uh, secretary of state, attorney general, state house, state senate, supreme court, Republic. Across the board. Across Absolutely. the board. Absolutely. And that And goes we're noted to, uh, as a democratic state. That's right. So that's uh, so why, quite interesting. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is that? That was the question we asked ourselves. And how are we going to fix that? And we really came down to one solution, and that is voter turnout. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2010, we had nearly one million Democrats, ID Democrats, not just voters, but Democrats that did not vote in 2010. Why do you think that is? Do you think maybe it's it's a it's a it's a frustration or a lack of interest or because of what's on the table or just the fact that they're not getting the information that they all need. Of, you know, all, all of the, the above. above. <laughs> you know, and, and there's, there's no one, one, um, one you know, uh, individual uh, item that you just listed that's responsible for. We all have to just take a hard look in the mirror and, 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 uh, and, and get to work. Um, you know, we, it starts with, first off, understanding who these voters are. Mm -hmm. We've done that at the party. You know, we have their name, their address, their phone number their social media contact, you know, I always joke that if you give this Obama team a few more weeks, they'll have the blood type of these donors. That's how, <laughs> that's how much information we have. It's very so, intricate this yeah, year, I can, I can tell. So. so we know who they are. But second, uh, we, what, what, what we've got to do is we've got to get good candidates. Um, and we've got to talk about the issues that they care about. Mm -hmm. We've got to do that, and that's what we've been doing over the last year and a half, is recruiting good candidates and addressing the, those voters' concerns. And third is the mechanical. You know, do people know it's election day? Do they know where they vote? Do they know they can vote by absentee if they're going to be away from their community? It's the mechanics of that. Has someone knocked on their door? Have they, has, you know, have they received a phone call? Did they see a newspaper story? So those are the three things we've, we've, uh, we've been doing. Identifying these voters, making sure that we're talking to them um, with good candidates, and then mechanics of, of get out the vote, of turning that vote out, putting those things in place. Uh, also, the issues are, are so important, too, and there's so much conflicting information um, out there, especially with these ads. I mean, you don't know which ones million to believe, right? dollars worth of ads sure. for one candidate mm -hmm. and who's not really ahead in the polls, and yet still money is being poured in there. And so We're seeing millions poured into Michigan from outside interest groups, you know, folks like the Koch brothers and other... Um, various uh, Republican special interest groups are coming into Michigan, and they know that um, you know that, that their candidates' um, issues are not appealing to the voters. So they're they're coming up, and oftentimes just you know with outright lies uh, on these television ads. Oftentimes you see these these spots that are just just way over the top, um, and um, you know they're they're thinking they can come in, tell a story, and they tell it often enough. Um, they'll be people victorious. will believe People it. will believe it. 
and Wilson. And the Michigan voter um, is smarter than that, and that's why you're seeing um, that you know we're, we're, we're despite having the, the Republicans and these uh, special interest groups spend millions on television, our candidates are still ahead. Um, Terry Lynn Land, mm -hmm. Gary Peters. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, Gary Peters is is ahead in the polls. Is mm -hmm. it? It's still That's still right. happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about um, his platform um, and how it contrasts with uh, Terry Lynn Lands. I know that they differ on 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 many things, um, especially on women's issues. Mm -hmm. So, where do you think the voters are going to go? Go with well, that. Well, first off, you know the voters are are seeking to replace Senator Carl Levin. You know, a man with over 35 years of, of history of serving Michigan. You know, and I think, you know, who was reelected time and again. Mm -hmm. And the question before the voters is, who is better positioned, who will do a, a better job in continuing in the same fashion that Senator Levin has so ably um, uh, performed for us? And that is, you know, that's, that's Gary Peters. You know, what we're looking for is someone to go to Washington and not be part of the partisan bickering. Who's, go who's going to go to Washington, roll up their sleeves, and work on a bipartisan basis, not as a Democrat or Republican, but to get things done for the state of Michigan. Gary Peters has done that throughout his career. Uh, he served as a member of Congress, and uh, uh, most recently, you know, the, the last uh, four years, when you look at that record, uh, it tells us that he's going to continue on in doing that. Uh, just a, a prime example, you know, he's, he's, um, he fought for the auto industry. You know, there were many in the Republican Party who just said, you know, let Detroit go bankrupt. I know um, Gary worked across the aisle with labor unions and businesses and the administration and banks to get the auto industry um, back rescued, up. back up and running. And, you know, what we're seeing in the Republicans, they said, no, let it go down. You know, Gary Peters um, has fought hard to keep make Wall Street accountable. Um, you know, a lot of what we saw in 2009 uh, and 2010 was just the result of just reckless Absolutely. financial behavior out of Wall Street. And again, it's Gary Peters who's gone. The uh, IPOs, the pump and dump, I mean, that, the that derivatives, whole all that, all process that. Just, just took us down mm -hmm. uh, extensively. But people made money on that, too. Sure. I mean, it was the, the, the higher echelon mm -hmm. um, at Wall Street and, and, and the, everybody and else. They made money, and, no one, and, and we paid and the price, no and they were never held accountable. And Gary Peters uh, worked to produce a, a series of reforms, uh, Wall Street reforms, that have never been done before, unprecedented in the history of, of, of regulation, and to make sure that those situations never happen again and those that, that did it are held accountable. Um, you know, Gary is just, um, he's someone, again, who's got a record, you know, five generations here in Michigan, a record of military service, just a record of service who's going to go to Washington and work on a bipartisan basis to get things done. We don't need another political, um, you know, party operative to go to Congress for us. We need someone who's going to roll up their sleeves and get things done for us, and that's Gary Peters. Absolutely. Um, on the issue of, of women's issues, I know I know Terry Lynn Lynn has been um, uh, very vocal uh, in regards to um, abortion, to be, in regards to pro-life, um, and, uh, and who decides that's another big fundamental difference between Gary Peters and Terry Land. Well, we had the whole Hobby Lobby issue. Well, right, too, you know, that's a I prime mean, example. The Hobby Lobby case basically is is. Um, as a woman, I would I would expect you know um, her being on a, on a on a on a different platform, but maybe you can explain it to us a little bit better. Well, Gary believes, like most people in this country in this state of Michigan, um, that a woman um, a woman's reproductive. Uh, rights and her health care choices should be left to her. It's that simple. And you know I have to agree to that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Lynn Land, you know, meanwhile thinks that it's okay for an employer to tell a woman, an employer, mind you, to tell a woman um, the type of contraception she should use. And that's you know that's a, a, a you know Gary Peters is obviously um, very much opposed to that um, and uh, will work to defend women's reproductive and, and health care choices in the state of Michigan. Um, Terry Lynn Lamb and agrees with those decisions, that an employer should have the ability to tell a woman um, what kind of uh, contraception or, or reproductive uh, uh, choices she, could, she should have. Another one is pay equity. You know, um, right now, if a woman is being paid less um, than a man in a job, um, she cannot find out whether or not she is in fact being paid less than a man doing the same job. Gary Peters is fighting hard. To, 2014. Uh, okay. Yes. We're still 2014. Dealing with that. <laughs> We're still dealing with that. Right. 
I think it's I think the last stat I saw was women earn seventy two cents for every dollar yeah. that a man makes. Well, the one way to fight that is to to allow women the ability to find out who's being paid what inside a corporation. And until you can do that, you don't you won't have the ability to to address that. Uh, Gary Peters is fighting very hard um, to uh, to uh, in the in the Senate. So what's the Congress. plan to do that? To to to, to present Pay legislation equity, fairness, uh, to correct. say that this has to be. And we've been talking about that for so long, and I still haven't seen that there's that um, you know there's there's that balance. So so hopefully this will be the year that uh, you know that's uh, that's addressed and discussed. You worked with uh, John Dingle's campaign. I did. I worked for John Dingle in 2002. It was one of the best years of my life. Uh, he, and and he's just an amazing individual. Um, Debbie Dingle is is vying for his uh, his mm -hmm. position this year. Um, tell us about that and tell us about her opponent a bit. And, sure. Uh, and well, we you know, can, we can we can sort of bring that into, Debbie into was, fruition. Here. There's no one more capable to to. You know, Debbie is 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 more than prepared to to step in and and to lead. Um, the 12th I, congressional district. I, I think aside of the fact that you know she is. Uh, Congressman Dingell's wife. I think on her own, she's been, you know, very independently um, involved and, and carries a long line of uh, of credibility. She has 30 years of community involvement inside the 12th district. Mm -hmm. 30 years. This isn't someone who's um, um, who's coming in. And, well, I'm the wife, and I and I should take this seat. That is not her at all. Anyone who knows her and anyone who's worked, seen her work in this community knows she's she's someone who knows how to roll up her sleeves and get things done. Um, for us in Washington D.C., there's not a community here that she isn't intimately, um, uh, intimately involved with, to uh, and hasn't been working with since for 30 years. She is someone who's going to go to Washington again and roll up her sleeves and get things done, and she knows how. To, most and more importantly, she knows how to get those things done. Right. And, and I, I believe she does have those relationships. Her opponent. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about her opponent, you know. But again, I do know Debbie Dingle, and she is someone who's going to go to Washington and get things done for the people of the 12th district. Okay, um, we have a neck and neck race um, uh, for uh, for governor. Uh, many people say that a lot of people still don't know who Mark Shower is um, and the anonymity of that name, um, and yet. They're sort of neck and neck in the polls, and mm -hmm. it, is it still is it still that? To, to yes, every I mean, there's last been last time just, I looked, it was there's been I think nearly a dozen polls that going have back showed, and forth. Yeah, uh, there's been a dozen polls that have shown either um, uh, Snyder and Shower neck and neck or Shower up, and like you said, there's still about 30 to 35 percent of the population who doesn't know who Mark Shower is yet, um, and we're working hard to make sure that that is um, you know that. That Mark's message gets out because we're confident when it does get out, he wins. And here's that message: you know, Mark is dedicated to creating a Michigan where everyone can stay, where we can stay and succeed in a Michigan that doesn't just reward the wealthy and the well connected. Um, and he'll do that by investing in and protecting our greatest assets: our people, our land, our Great Lakes. You know, this governor likes to talk about tough choices that he's made to to get Michigan on the right track. Well, first off, we're not on the right track. You know, when he took over, we were at the Fifth highest unemployment rate in the country. Today we're at the third. Um, we've seen over a billion dollars taken out of our education system. We've seen um, labor with its collective rights just stripped away. We've seen um, uh, seniors paying a pension tax. You know, all that. You know, those are tough choices. Those were tough on the wrong people. This governor has um, has continuously um, come after the people who work for a living in this state. And made us pay a 1.8 billion dollar for for a 1.8 billion dollar tax break that went to, went to corporations. So he took office, and he created a 1.8 billion dollar tax break for corporations. And by our constitution, our budget has to be balanced year after year. So he looked around and said, "How do how do I pay for a 1.8 billion dollar tax break for corporations?" Here's how we did it. Now, was that playing the devil's advocate here? Was mm -hmm. that was that was that to create more interest in coming into? Our state to create business. That's what he says. He says that by giving by giving a 1.8 billion dollar tax break to business, that more mm -hmm. businesses would come to Michigan. Well, it's not true. It, it hasn't worked. You know, it, it hasn't worked. Statistically speaking, has, is there no. is there anything to show that, that our was... unemployment rate is? We went. Our unemployment has gotten worse since Governor Snyder has taken office. He we were at in the, in the, uh, when he took office. We were at the third highest or fifth highest unemployment mm -hmm. rate. Well, today we're the third, the third highest. 
It's just not working what this man is doing. You don't take $1.8 billion of our tax dollars, give it to corporations with no guarantee for that money. We received nothing. There was no guarantee of a job or a Michigan that, uh, that they would stay in Michigan or that jobs would be created. That $1.8 billion of our money went to Chicago, it went to New York, it went to the Cayman Islands, it went everywhere but in Michigan. It's just not working what this governor's doing. And what is, what is uh, uh, Mark Schauer's antidote to that? Well, you know, first off, we've got to create a state where, where we can stay and succeed. Everyone. You know, we've, we've got people leaving the state, you know, by the, by the thousands. Um, number one, we need to reinvest in education. You, know, you don't create a state where people can, can succeed in by cutting a billion dollars from education. So that, those funds have to be brought back into education. Number two, you know, what... And that's, that's one of my primary um, um, platforms and very vocal about in terms of education um, mm -hmm. and, and it, m misleading in terms of giving one billion dollars to education where, where, where basically there was more cuts and I, I think it was three percent per student. You know what, was, you, we, we can cut. argue the numbers all day long. Call any teacher. I would ask all your voters, uh, all the viewers, to just call a teacher. Ask a parent, are their, are their classrooms more crowded? Are teachers um, leaving? Are they being laid off? Are they paying, having to pay money for extracurricular activities? Right? I, mean, I, I, I can't Absolutely. tell you how many times I see car washes for band uniforms or, or for football. I come from a right? family of educators, and I know that a lot of the personal money, and friends, and a lot of personal money is going into trying to you know, create the same quality into their classroom. I saw, um, I saw an ad by Target the other day, and, 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 and you know, good for them. But they're running ads to help teachers get, a, uh, get school supplies for their, their school districts. You know, having to give, teachers are coming out of their pocket, out of their pocket to buy school supplies for the children. You tell me if those ads were necessary, if we weren't, billion dollars hadn't been taken out of our classrooms? Just the, the facts speak for themselves. This governor can talk all he wants about the numbers, um, but the facts on the ground are we've got dozens of school districts teetering on insolvency. We've got more, we've got clouded, class, clouded, uh, crowded classrooms, and we've got extracurricular activities uh, being cut. The voters of Michigan see that. Absolutely, um, and and I think that's the most evident um, thing when you want to talk about facts. Um, you know, even on a bipartisan level, you know, forget about Republicans, forget about Democrats. You're looking at education, you're looking at the kids, and you're looking at how they're being affected. Um, and and I'm looking at charter schools, and mm -hmm. and I look at charter schools on a personal level um, as a business rather than um, a process of educating our kids. And I and I see those are really um, you know popping up you know, in, in many different areas. Some are great, um, but again, is education really a corporate aspect, a business aspect, or is it the basis of, of creating a better a city, a better state, right. a better country, and, and really investing in our kids on a public level, because public education needs to be accessible for all kids That's what education is about, board. is making sure that everyone has a solid foundation to go out there and succeed. And you know, no one is doubting that education um, d doesn't have to continuously evolve to meet the needs of, of our students as they move into you know, a very fast-paced world. Um, but the question really before us, do those changes, are those changes, uh, does education evolve in a private, for-profit setting or in a public setting? We believe in the Democratic Party that public education should be invested in and not, um, not sent off to experiment with a for-profit uh, uh, entity, and and a lot of a lot of the kids may be going through the cracks because if they don't have a good public education within their neighborhoods, they don't have an opportunity have to, to, to transfer or to or, or, or to uh, you know. A lot of these charters are going in and they're cherry picking the students that they want, right? And and what that does is it reduces the funds to that public educate that public education system. And you know you could have the best charters in the world, but if a child doesn't have the opportunity to get to it, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the 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 funding for the, those public education units will go down. So every student that goes to a charter school, that money gets taken off the public education roll and moved to a for-profit or or a charter setting, and that's weakening our public education education system.
So instead of trying to experiment with for-profit centers and so forth, let's just put the dollars into public education and lift every student up. And when you talk about salaries uh, in terms of teachers, um, that needs to be increased to really be able to attract teachers into into that into that profession because right. uh, you know we 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 need to have that's the, that's the basis of our communities that's and right. if we don't have the best teachers coming in um, who are going to get a rate of return on their investment as well um, mm -hmm. and want to be in that profession you know we we, we definitely have an issue we need, in we our need state. to keep and attract the best possible teachers we can you know and oftentimes again call a teacher and just ask them. You know, what, what we're seeing in many school districts is they're laying off a 45, 50 year old teacher and hiring uh, you know, a 23, 24 year old teacher. Cutting because, the salary. Cutting and, the, because right. it's, it's cheaper. Right. You know, um, health care has really been on the table quite a bit too um, with, with I mean, what's called the Obamacare. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen it's, it's affected seniors a little bit too, mm -hmm. so maybe you can, you can create some clarity on this. Um, even with, with my parents, you know, I've, I've seen that uh, I was just looking at some, what, some, a form the other day that said their co pays are going to be, um, you know, increased a bit. Their, their medical, uh, their, their, their co pays for medicine is going to be increased. And I know that there's a balance. So talk to us a little bit about that balance in terms of the Affordable Health Care Act, you mm -hmm. know, for everybody and how particular individuals are being affected in terms of, of what their co-pays are and their deductibles? Well, the, the Affordable Health Care Act, essentially what it, what it does is it makes, it, it makes health care more accessible uh, for everyone. Absolutely, yes. Um, it also uh, makes it more affordable. It also provides better coverage. And it also holds the feet to the fire of these insurance companies. No longer can people be dropped if they develop cancer or some other sort of catastrophic injury. Um, what we have before was a system whereby your, your insurance company could, try, could drop you at any moment. Women were being charged more than men, um, and you know the, the premium rate was just going through the roof. Um, what the ACA uh, uh, has done is given more people the ability to, to be secure in their health care um, <clears throat> and made it more affordable. And that's what, that's what really this is about, because what happens is when somebody's not covered, and, they, and they're injured, um, where do they go? They go to the emergency room, and they're going to be covered there. And that bill then gets passed along to everyone. Well, there, yeah. on, on the flip side of that, again, the devil's advocate, um, many say that um, they weren't able to keep their own doctor. Many say that um, some of their um, health care uh, uh, services have been, you know, diminished in a way. So how, how do we, how do, how do you um, address that? I mean, wh where's the balance in that? Well, the balance is making sure that everyone, again, well, anytime there's going to be there's going to be problems when we first roll uh, roll out healthcare. Absolutely. You know, anytime you're that. trying to reform such a massive um, part of our economy, there's going to be problems. But you don't throw. The answer isn't to throw out um, uh, uh, ACA. Uh, the the answer is to fix those problems, and that's what this Congress and uh, uh, this Congress has failed to do. You know, they've voted now I think 47 times to repeal ACA. Instead of attempting to fix, you know, the, the problems that that uh, that were that were there in the beginning, they voted to repeal it 47 times, even though it's been judged constitutional by the Supreme Court. It was passed by the House, passed by the Senate, signed by the President, and the states are implementing it. These Republicans, instead of, you know, it's the Republicans. I don't think are are, are caring. They don't care at this. Uh, what what they're afraid of. They're, they're, not, they're not interested in fixing it. What they're worried about is it does work. They're, 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 they're very concerned, I think, that, um, you know, that these insurance, you know, when you look at the Republican Party and who they're backed by, they're backed by these insurance companies. And they, what they don't want to see happen, I, I believe, is, you know, a, a, a health care system that endangers those interests. Absolutely. Um, you, you, you called the Republican Party... Um, a hot mess. <laughs> they are a hot mess. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, many people I, I think are um, are a little bit, um, uh, for lack of information, in regards to um, the Tea Party um, having a Republic candidate, having a, a Tea Party candidate run run against um, that Republican Party. Shed shed a little bit of light 
for us on that? Look, what, what the Republican Party, I think, is at a civil war inside itself. They, they, don't under, they don't know who they are. You know, they've got about 35% of their own party who, doesn't even, who voted to remove their own lieutenant governor. That is unheard of. Um, you know, all across the state, you have the Tea Party, um, these Tea Party extremists that are being, you know, that, that are, uh, you know, that have come. It's no longer, you know, the Republican Party at some point used to be the party of, you know, limited government. That was a philosophy. But they've migrated to the party of no. No on anything. No government, no on, no, no, government plays no role in anything that, that, uh, that has to do with American lives. And that's just not a practical solution. They're sending these folks to Washington who just go in and vote no on everything. And without ever trying to, you know, a, a prime example here is our roads. We have the worst roads we've ever had in the state of Michigan. And it's because this Tea Party um, will not uh, sit down and even forget cooperating with the Democrats, even cooperate within their own party to come up with solutions. And this governor doesn't have the ability to go in and, and get their votes. There's a reason the Republicans run the governor's office, the House, the Senate, but we Supreme need good Court, roads. And we yet, need... <laughs> these roads aren't done yet. Why? And, it's and because that would they've got forty percent of the would... thirty to forty percent of their their party won't even sit down with their their sitting governor and negotiate to come up with a solution. You know, when you look at other other states um, and you look at our our road infrastructure, I, it, it it does give you you know a sense of you know, maybe we're, we're living in, in, in the Stone Age, literally. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are being affected, and, and I would think that that would be on the table, and then there would be a, a, a concerted effort to make sure. Everyone's paying for the roads. That, absolutely, and I think the money is there. It's just, it's just not being, the, you know. The um, Tea Party, um, you know, the hard right of their party won't sit down and negotiate with their own governor, and he does not have the ability to persuade them. There was a, and so um, because of that, we're all paying. The average Michigan consumer pays over $350 per year as a result of damages to their cars. A, a recent Republican, really quick, we need mm -hmm. to wrap this up, but a sure. recent Republican, Governor Milliken, mm -hmm. um, just endorsed uh, Gary Peters. Gary Peters and Mark Totten. And Mark Totten. Who's running for Attorney General. And that's... Um, Two Democrats. That's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely very interesting. Um, there's so much more to talk about, um, and uh, uh, I, I hope that you'll come back um, uh, prior to the elections or even after the elections so Absolutely. we can talk about, uh, about, about those results. But thank you very much for coming here. There's a gamut of things we can discuss, but I hope you'll come back on Community Connections so we Absolutely. can do that. Great. Well, thank you, much for, thank thank you very you. much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Michigan Democratic Chair Lon Johnson with us today on a candid conversation Hope we cleared out uh, some, some, some misconceptions and uh, gave you some good information. Don't forget to vote. Go out there, make your voice heard, regardless of what it is. Vote. Have a wonderful day.